Hello and welcome to another lecture in the Abralinha ao Vivo series. Abralinha ao Vivo is an initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association. I am Miguel Oliveira, president of Abralin. Today, I'd like to introduce Jeffrey Sachs, who is a professor and associate chair of psychological and brain sciences at Washington University. Uh, studying perception, memory, and action using converging co cognitive neuroscience methods across the lifespan. Professor Zacks is a recipient of awards from the NSF, Psychonomic Society, APA, APF, and a fellow of AAAS, APS, APA, the Midwest Psychological Association, and the Society of Experimental Psychologists. He published three books, two edited volumes, more than 100 journal articles, and articles for Saloon, Ion, and the New York Times. The title of his lecture today is Event Representation in Language, Perception, and Memory. Before we start, I'd like to thank Jeffrey Zacks for accepting a Berlin's invitation and to say that questions and comments are very welcome in the chat. After his presentation, we restart the debate with invited discussants, Alistair Knott, Anna Papafrugo, and Gerard Altman. Please join me and welcome Jeffrey Zacks. Your audio is off, Jeff. Thank you. It wouldn't be a Zoom talk. So Miguel, thank you so much. Um, I'm I'm thrilled and honored to be uh, included in the Alberlin Al Vivo lecture series. I'm particularly grateful to the organizers for taking a wide view here, encompassing those areas of the cognitive sciences that touch on the study of language while joining it with other mechanisms. Um, and I'm also super grateful to my colleagues, Jerry Altman, Alistair Knott and Anna Papa Prabhu for joining us. Let me share my video here. All right. And so first off, I would like to acknowledge um, the funders of this research most of what I'm going to tell you about was fun, has been funded by the United States Office of Naval Research and National Institutes of Health. We also have um, current funding from the James S. McDonald Foundation, for which we are very grateful. Let me begin with a general theoretical claim to orient the discussion. I would like to suggest that cognition uses structured event representations, which we'll call event models, to capture information about the spatiotemporal framework of activity, the entities and objects involved in the activity, and other salient features of a situation. I know I would acknowledge, frankly, that there's reasons to be skeptical of this representation heavy view, because re-representing a world that is before our very eyes is an expensive and unwieldy cognitive and computational operation. But I'd like to suggest that by carving up nature at its joints, event models enable effective predictive processing in complex naturalistic dom domains from language comprehension and production to action observation to action control. Let me make this a little bit more concrete with an example. Suppose that you observe two people, Rebecca and Zach, and Rebecca is in the middle of pack it, passing milk to Zach. And then a moment later, Zach has accepted the milk and then Zach is pouring the milk into his coffee. One way that one could represent the situation and parts of the brain definitely do this is in terms of features that are close to the physical structure of the activity. So we could represent the velocity of the hands, angles between the joints, torques on those joints, um, contact relations between objects and between objects in the body. If you represent the situation in those terms, you notice that from moment to moment, many features of the situation are changing. And the trajectories of those changes might be quite challenging for the system to learn and extract regularities from. On the other hand, 
If the brain constructs a representation in terms of a spatiotemporal framework in which a set of entities are interacting with objects to achieve a sequentially structured pattern of activity, you have pretty different representations. So the features might be things like Rebecca giving milk to Zach, Zach holding the milk. And we'd note that from A to B, many fewer features are changing. So first Rebecca was holding the milk, now she's not. And then as we go from B to C, Zach was not pouring, now he is. And that sequence of transitions might be much more learnable than trying to learn on this stuff. What that means is that events don't just live in the world, they live as much in our heads and they're conceptualizations that are constructed by our brains moment to moment. I wanna, to, to make this a little bit more concrete, I wanna start with an example from language. I wanna thank Rebecca Defina for sharing this with me. Um, Rebecca did some really creative work on serial verb constructions in the Avatime language. Serial verb constructions are syntactic constructions where multiple verbs occur in a single clause with no coordination or subordination. So these are not complex um, verb structures. They're essentially lists of verbs that are articulated. And in one experiment, she studied them in conjunction with speaker's production of iconic gestures, gestures that are semantically related to speech, displaying aspects of the same scene described in their speech in another form and manner. So the idea is that um, both the gestural component of the utterance and the verbal component are generated off of a common representational system. So that if serial verb constructions are conceptualizations of single events, then they ought to be accompanied by no more uh, than one iconic gesture. Avatime is a language that's spoken by about 15,000 people in Southern Ghana, and it includes serial verb constructions as illustrated here. So you've got a transcription on the top and then a gloss. And what you're gonna see in this very quick video clip is that right at the end of the utterance, the speaker is talking about a history of the community and she's going to uh, give this pair of verbs and you'll see one gesture that spans across that little list of verbs. So as she's um, uttering that, she's making that that list. And what you find is that that pattern is very typical and the exceptions are not attested at all in this database. So um, out of a large number of serial verb constructions, you find a good number that are accompanied by single totally overlapping gestures. You never see ones that are accompanied by more than one gesture. Whereas for other complex verb phrases, you see um, gestures that may be occasionally accompanied by a single, um, uh, that may span, uh, a single gesture may span the construction. And you may see even more frequently, multiple iconic gestures. In a follow-up experiment, uh, Rebecca showed that priming Avatime speakers with serial verb constructions led them to group animated activities into larger events in a nonverbal task. So language priming was able to affect nonverbal cognition. And together, these things are just one source of evidence that there's a common representational medium of event construals that's driving uh, some of these language phenomena. Now, if this is the case, then as we move through our lives, we must be constructing a sequence of event representations, and that may be characteristic of comprehending language. Now, I want to be careful. I don't mean that every single time a producer or a comprehender encounters event-related language that they have to be doing this, but I think that in the case of discourse about events, conversations about events, comprehension and production of narratives, this is um, a, an obligatory and ongoing component of language processing. Rolf Swan put it this way, construal is the integration of functional webs in a mental simulation of a specific event. The grammatical unit on which construals operate is an intonation unit. So the idea is that each time um, the system handles an intonation unit, 
it is constructing a little low level event representation then these things might be grouped into larger events these are bounded in time and location and they have a particular perspective and they're akin swan argues to the sequential acquisition of information from visual fixation so the idea is that in the same way that we explore the visual world in little bite-sized pieces constructing up representational units that have structure we um, process language by constructing little glimpses of the world that are micro events. Um, so as uh, Anna Papa Fergu has argued, these conceptualizations importantly have uh, internal structure to them. So thematic roles are sometimes computed very quickly from sparse information. So Anna in conjunction with Ilan Hoffrey and others showed that, that comprehenders can work out the agent, um, patient, and object of a, a, of a visual scene very quickly from a very um, brief mass presentation. Um, and in work with Wilson and colleagues, she showed that thematic roles are organized hierarchically so that the, the most often thing mentioned is the agent followed by the patient and then the object and then other um, components of the activity. Um, Alistair Knott in his work has shown that this structure within event representations has constrained temporal dynamics. So if I watch you grab a cup, I will generally first focus on you, then focus on the cup, and then monitor the motor, your motor execution leading to the end state of you holding the cup. If I grab a cup myself, the temporal dynamics are pretty much the same, except in the first stage, the focus is a different agent, myself rather than you, then I'm gonna focus on the cup and monitor the execution. If I comprehend language, maybe what I'm doing, if I'm reading a, sent, a, a phrase like the man grabs the cup is focusing on the agent again, focus on the cup, encode the action, the end state. And Ali's argued, that this gives a good account of the logical form that we observe for um, event descriptions. In short, one possibility is that there's a dynamical template for event representations that sh that's shared across perception, action, control, and language. To explore that idea, I want to now turn to some data from our lab. Um, and this first set of studies is going to use neuroimaging to explore some of the internal structure of event representations. So in these studies, people watched movies or read stories, and we coded them for changes in a number of dimensions of the situation. So um, in, this, in one study, they watched the children's film, The Red Balloon, and we coded for changes in the number of situational dimensions. I'll talk about some of the others in a minute, but for now I wanna focus on changes in object interactions, such as when the boy grabs this balloon and changes in spatial location, uh, such as when we go from inside to outside or vice versa. We can apply the same kind of coding to narrative texts. So this is a very interesting text, um, no novel length description of a day in the life of one boy in the middle of the United States in a rural town in the middle of the 20th century. It was collected by Roger Barker and Herbert Wright and their colleagues. And this brief passage, Mrs. Birch stepped into Raymond's bedroom, pulled a light cord hanging from the center of the room and turned to the bed, illustrates how we can code for changes in spatial location and changes in object interactions, much like we do for the movies. I'm focusing on these two dimensions because we had strong a priori reason to suspect that there might be um, uh, particular uh, neural uh, markers of processing these dimensions that we could pick up with functional MRI. So an area first identified by Russell Epstein and Nancy Canwisher in the parahippocampal gyrus has been shown to be selectively activated when people look at pictures of places as compared to almost anything else. So this is a coronal slice uh, through the head. So if I'm standing up this, right, this is the plane that's parallel with my torso. And you can see that there at the bottom of the temporal lobes um, is a pair of areas that are selectively activated when we are looking at pictures of places compared to other things. This is the same area in an axial slice, so parallel to the ground if I'm standing, from a study by um, Amy Shelton and John Gabrielli in which 
people navigated in a virtual reality environment, and that was compared to a control condition in which they were processing similar spatial information, but from an overhead view. We also could posit specific processing resources for um, uh, object interaction changes, particularly in the somatose somatosensory cortex and premotor cortex. So this is from a review from Umberto Castillo, illustrating how if you have people grabbing objects in the scanner, you get selective activity in the premotor cortex and in the somatosensory cortex. This is an off-center sagittal slice, um, so uh, running parallel to the side of my head. And it's cutting through the left hemisphere because the motor system and somatosensory system are organized contralaterally, such that if I am grabbing something with my right hand, that's gonna selectively activate my left hemisphere. All the participants in the studies I'm gonna describe are um, left dominant, so presume right-handed, presumably they're, um, uh, they're constructing representations that involve right-handed grasping. So if we have people watching a movie and we time lock brain activity to those points at which the spatial location changes, we see selective increases in that parapocampal gyrus area. If we take a different group of participants and ask them to read the narratives and do a similar time locking to spatial changes, we see selective activity in pretty much the same area. If we time lock to object changes, now, um, we see selective activity in premotor and somatosensory cortex. So here I'm showing you lateral views of the surface of the brain. And you can see that the premotor cortex and somatosensory cortex are both activated in the left hemisphere. There are other areas that are activated, but those are activated bilaterally. The laterally selective area is in those motor related areas. And you see exactly the same thing when you time lock to object changes in um, narrative texts. So the neural dynamics of event conceptualization, so consistency across visual and, uh, and narrative comprehension and are systematically related to event features. If what we are doing as we are comprehending these sequences of events is constructing a sequence of conceptualizations that go from event to event to event, this means that segmentation of the ongoing activity into events has to be an obligatory component of comprehension. And in the lab, we have been studying this for a number of years using a task that was first developed by the social psychologist Darren Knudsen. Um, what we do is have people watch a movie or read us or listen to a story and ask them to press a button whenever in their judgment one meaningful unit of activity ends and another begins we tell them there's no right or wrong answer we're simply interested in their judgments and we might tell them to segment into the smallest units that they find meaningful or the largest units they find meaningful um, i'll call those fine and coarse grained uh, segmentation what i'm going to show you here is a short clip in which a man is washing dishes in a kitchen. And what you're going to see down below is each time someone pressed the button to mark. So as he finishes scraping the first plate, most of the 16 observers in the study identified fine grain units. So far, only as he scrapes each plate, um, people agree that that's fine grain unit activity. As he finishes scraping the last plate and then turns and reorients his body uh, to open the dishwasher, that people are going to judge that to be a fine grain event boundary and a coarse grain event boundary. Now, that short clip illustrates some strong regularities that we and others have observed in people's deliberate segmentation of ongoing activity. First, you see intersubjective agreement. There are a few places that most of our observers identified as event boundaries, and then there are a number of places uh, that nobody identifies as an event boundary. You also can see evidence for hierarchical organization. The fine-grained event boundary encapsulates a, sub, a subsequence of smaller, uh, sorry, the coarse-grained event boundary encapsulates a subsequence of finer-grained events. And last but not least, um, we see time-locked neural activity. So let me show you what that looks like. If you ask people to watch a movie of an everyday activity like that one, and then afterwards ask them to segment it using that task, you can time lock the brain activity before they learned of this event segmentation task. 
um, to their subsequent segmentation. And so here, what I'm showing you are two lateral views, left hemisphere and right hemisphere, and two medial views of the brain, where the highlighted areas are areas that had significant phasic changes at those moments in time that people identified as event boundaries. This graph over here is showing you what those look like. So relative to the point at which they went on to identify an event boundary, activity starts creeping up and then peaks about 10 seconds later. The fMRI response is time shifted because it's a blood effect rather than um, direct observation of the neural activity. So the peak in the neural activity associated with this is happening a little bit after the event boundary. And you can see in this case, it's larger for the coarse grain boundaries than for the fine grain boundaries. And that's a typical result as well. Results such as this are similar, whether you're having people segment everyday events or commercial films or reading stories. So there are transient increase in the overall magnitude of activity across um, a number of regions in the brain uh, at event boundaries. Concurrent with those phasic changes, changes in the overall magnitude are changes in the local pattern of activity. So this is from a study by Chris Baldassano and his colleagues in which participants watched um, one episode of the, of the TV show Sherlock, and they looked for areas of the brain that showed shifts in the local pattern of activity. And for each of those areas, they estimated when those shifts occurred and counted the number of event shifts that, or of, of pattern shifts that best accounted for the activity in that area. So here I'm showing you the results of that study mapped in the same way as the previous one. So the lateral left hemisphere and right hemisphere, the medial left hemisphere and right hemisphere. The color coding here is showing you the number of pattern updates that were observed while watching this movie. And what you see is that in areas like the early visual cortex, the pattern is shifting quite frequently. Whereas in some of those areas that we saw that showed the strongest activation in overall increase in in activity at event boundaries, the pattern is shifting much more slowly. So in these areas in the medial prefrontal cortex, sorry, in the medial parietal cortex and in the lateral parietal cortex. This is illustrating um, for one case, what those, the timing of those shifts look like as we go from earlier visual cortex to late visual to the angular gyrus, to the posterior medial cortex, the Timing is getting coarser and coarser, but you can again see this hierarchical organization where these coarser grained uh, event boundaries or pattern shifts are a subset of the finer grained pattern shifts. And if we compare those to human annotators identification of event boundaries, we see that there's a strong alignment between the brain's pattern shifts and what people judge to be event boundaries. I want to again emphasize that in both of these studies, participants are not asked about segmentation before or during movie viewing. So this is reflecting the ongoing activity of the brain. When, when we look at that ongoing activity, we see that transient responses and pattern shifts align with deliberate segmentation. These transient responses and pattern shifts happen on multiple timescales, which suggests that the brain is building a sequence of event representations on multiple timescales during comprehension. This leads to the question of what the brain is using to control this construction and updating process. One possibility I would like to suggest is that the brain can use um, spikes in prediction error as a control signal to tell it when to update representations. So the, the model that we have proposed um, called event segmentation theory, suggests that as we are comprehending an ongoing event or a narrative text, we're constantly, our brains are constantly generating predictions about what's going to happen in the near future, guided by event models, these um, conceptualizations of what's currently happening. And those event models are stable in the same way that your representation of your perceptual world is stable um, despite your eyes darting around. The brain constantly compares the predictions that are generated from this perceptual processing stream to what is actually sensed, um, giving it a monitor of how it's doing. When it detects a spike in prediction error, it gates open 
the inputs to the event models, destabilizing them and allowing them to settle into a new conceptualization. At those moments, the input is not just coming from what's in front of our eyeballs, but also from our knowledge in the form of schemas for how events typically unfold, and also perhaps from our episodic memory for related events that may have occurred in the recent past. So the dynamics of this unfold like this. Over time, hopefully most of the time, prediction error is low, but from time to time, prediction error spikes. And at those moments, your event representations transition from one uh, state to another. This proposal entails a couple um, relationships between stuff that's happening in the world and stuff that's happening in your event representations. One is that segmentation should be time locked to changes in, in features of the world. Because other things being equal, prediction errors are going to tend to occur when more things are changing. So in those um, two studies I told you about um, at the beginning of the talk, we coded, as I mentioned, for changes in object interactions in space, but we also coded for a bunch of other dimensions of the situation to ask whether changes in the narrative situation were accompanied by perception that a new event had begun. And what you find is that for both fine-grained units of activity and coarse-grained units of activity, the more changes are happening in a five-second interval, the more likely people are to perceive uh, event boundaries. And similar results have been uh, found by uh, Joe Magliano and Marcus Huff and others. In um, the narrative texts, we can take a passage such as this one and code it on a similar set of dimensions. So um, we can mark when a new action that wasn't uh, a new feature that wasn't identified with a previously uh, attested clause occurs, um, when a new character um, appears, when a new goal is undertaken, when a new object is introduced, or when we have a change in space or time. So for example, when we read Mrs. Bir Mr. Birch came in, that's a change in spatial location. It also introduces a new character. When Mrs. Birch pulled a light cord, that's a change in object interaction. We presented these narratives in three ways. Um, auditorily, so they were recorded by a trained narrator and read to part and participants listened to the recording. Uh, they were presented visually in individual clauses, or they were presented visually as text on a page. For those first two presentation modalities, people press the button as they listened or read. For the third, um, they simply mark their boundaries on a sheet of paper, the same sheet of paper that had the text on it. No matter how it's presented, no matter how they respond, you see that the more things are changing in a clause, the more likely they are to perceive an event boundary for both fine and coarse grained events. So together, these things are consistent with the idea that the brain is updating event representations at those points as a result of prediction error that's triggered by changes in features of the situation. But looking at changes in features of the situation doesn't directly assay prediction error. So in a few studies, we've looked directly at prediction error using direct and indirect methods. So one way to do this is to present people with sequences, either movies or texts, for which we know where the event boundaries are. And what you're going to see in a minute is that the movie is going to stop. And at that point, we would ask people to predict what's going to happen next. So here the movie stops. Then we present participants with two pictures and ask them to choose which of those depicts what happens next in that clip uh, five seconds in the future. So it's always exactly five seconds in the future. In this case, the one on the right is what occurs in in five seconds and the one on the left comes from an alternate take in which the woman is waxing her car rather than washing it. The design is very simple. So based on the previous segmentation data, we identify event boundaries and we either stop the movie in the middle of an event so that five seconds in the future is still part of the same event or two and a half seconds before one of these event boundaries so that five seconds in the future is a new event. So the clips pause, they make their response, and then the clip is restarted so they get to see whether they were right or not. What you find is that prediction errors are more likely 
when five seconds in the future would comprise a new event than when it's a continuation of the same event. And that um, when that happens, when people are trying to predict across that event boundary, whether or not they make an error, they activate parts of the midbrain that are associated with error signaling in the brain. Those data are suggestive, but one limitation I want to acknowledge is that doing this prediction task requires that we interrupt the ongoing cognitive activity that we're interested in studying. So in more recent studies, we've been using methods that are designed to allow people to go on with their comprehension and not be interrupted by our tasks. This paradigm developed by Michelle Eisenberg takes advantage of a phenomenon I want to illustrate with this clip. So you're going to see a slowed down version of this woman um, uh, making breakfast. And this pink dot is tracking the eye of one of our observers. You'll see a series of yellow boxes turning on three seconds before she's about to reach for a sequence of objects. And what you see in each case is that the eye has landed in the yellow box well ahead of her hand. So if you watch there, her eye goes to the pan and then three seconds later, she picks up the pan. So this is a, a robust phenomenon, both when people are acting in the world and when they're observing other actions. The eyes look predictively ahead to objects that are going to be interacted with. So we took advantage of that to look at um, prediction as a function of event representations. So what I'm plotting here is the amount of time within a set of 500 millisecond windows that people are looking in those boxes around the objects. And what you can see is a lot of predictive looking. So if you start um, three seconds before, you see that well before the object contact occurs, people are looking at the objects. The green lines illustrate the, the, those looks to objects that occurred when an object was contacted in the middle of an event whereas the orange ones show objects that were contacted near an event boundary we, we, when we would expect there to be more prediction error. And you can see that it's not a huge effect, but early in the game, they're more likely to look ahead to that object if it's within an event. And then later, the people near an event boundary, people are getting to that object around the time of the hand, certainly, and often well before it, but they're a little bit slower and they're playing a little bit of catch up as they get there. So people are, people's predictive looking is slightly but significantly impaired around event boundaries. This has both immediate and long-term consequences for our conceptual, conceptualizations. So in a series of experiments, Kenneth Swallow showed, uh, looked at how event representations are updated and accessed online as a function of event structure. To do this, she scoured the cinema of the world of the world, collecting clips like this. This is from the Jacques Tati film, Mon Uncle. And what you're gonna see is in a few seconds, he's gonna walk through that door behind. And in a pretest, we found that most of our participants judged that change of spatial location to be a major event boundary. So there he goes, and then exactly five seconds after an object of interest went off the screen, we tested people's ability to retrieve information about that object by presenting them with that object paired with a foil and asking them which of those had just been in the film. In this case, the answer is the, is the chair on the right. If you were at sea guessing which it was, don't feel bad. People are pretty much at chance for that item, despite the fact that the object was centrally presented and was on the screen for more than 10 seconds. The design of this study is very simple. Um, the, the objects um, appeared either during, um, such that they were encoded either while an event boundary happened, we'll call those boundary objects, or such that they were encoded in the middle of an event. And then they were always tested exactly five seconds after they went off the screen, but five seconds later could still be part of the same event or it could have crossed an event boundary such that they're trying to retrieve from an event that is now ended. And we hypothesized that retrieving across an event boundary would be particularly challenging, especially for these ones that are encoded in the middle of an event. One might suspect that encoding during another event boundary 
if you're updating your event conceptualization at that point, that might lead to some preferential encoding that would allow decent access, even after you've crossed an event boundary. But here they ought to be in bad shape. The trial I showed you is from one of these, one of, one of this condition. And you can see that in general, when it's an act, when, when it's an object that was not encoded during an event boundary and it's tested across an event boundary, um, performance is basically a chance. Whereas as long as you're still in the same event, performance is excellent. Interestingly, those objects that were encoded during an event boundary, but not tested during, um, uh, tested across an event boundary are also pretty good. And I'll return to that in a minute. So identification of an object seen just five seconds ago is worse if an event boundary occurred after that object disappears. If the object was encoded during an event boundary, this is protective. And in a subsequent um, fMRI study, uh, Kenna found that activity in parts of the brain, the hippocampus and surrounding structures that are associated with retrieval from long-term memory um, is greater when people are successfully retrieving across an event boundary. And this suggests that event models are updated at event boundaries, leading to both short-term and long-term consequences. One current area of uh, concern in the lab has been about how that ongoing updating process shapes our ability to learn about events, particularly when things change in the world and better guide our cognition. So this is work uh, that was led by Chris Walheim and David Stwarczyk uh, with collaboration from Michelle Eisenberg. And in these studies, people watch long movies, about 35, 40 minutes of a day in the life of an actor. We're about two thirds of the way through the movie. Our actor is returning from work. She gets out of her car, walks up to the door, unlocks the door and goes inside. The movie starts when she gets up in the morning, it ends when she goes to bed at night. After watching one of these movies, we um, ask, we tell participants that we'd like them to watch a second movie depicting a different day in our, in our actor's life. And we let them know that they're gonna see some classes of activity that they saw on the first day. So here again, about two thirds of the way through, she gets out of her car, walks up to the door, unlocks the door and goes inside. You may have noticed on that second day that rather than unlocking the deadbolt, she unlocks the door handle below it. And so our hypothesis was that if people are spontaneously retrieving information what about what happened on the first day and using that to guide their predictions by incorporating it into their event conceptualizations, then that ought to lead to a prediction error um, when she reaches for the other lock. Now, in the short term, this is going to impair your ability to comprehend on, uh, the situation, including the language involved. We think it happens because most of the time, repetitions are more likely than changes. And even when things change, that could drive new learning that would be in the long-term beneficial. So to study this, we again turn to eye tracking. So what I'm showing you here is the proportion of looks into the target location of that object that she's uh, gonna reach for on the second day. Um, because each of these activities is a different length, We've warped time here into two equal intervals, one from the beginning of the activity to the point where the two versions diverge, and then one from that divergence point to the end of the activity. And, um, and what you see is that just like in the previous eye tracking study, even on the first day, there's a good bit of predictive looking. So people's eyes are reaching the object well before her hand gets there. And at this point, if we're looking at their viewing on day one, the changed and repeated, or sorry, the repeated and changed versions are identical to the participants. So we see a very similar looking pattern. On day two, um, if the activity is repeated, then very early in the game, they start looking at that target object and they continue looking at it up until the reach. Whereas if, the, if it changes, so if before they saw this and now they're seeing this, we find that early in the game, there's little looking there, but they do again catch up. What are they doing during that early 
interval. Well, often what they're doing is looking at the thing that the person had reached to before. So this is evidence that they're making a prediction that is in this case, a prediction error guided by their memory retrieval. And our hypothesis was that if making that error triggers updating your event conceptualization, that this could have benefits for long-term memory, uh, for the, in, particularly encoding into long-term memory, such that this predictive looking error ought to be more likely on just those cases that people have better memor, memory later for the fact that it changed. So we bring people back a week later and I'm gonna break down this black line here based on whether or not they were able to tell us a week later that that activity was one that had changed. And what you find is that making that predictive looking error is associated with better memory for the change a week later. So in two experiments, memory for a similar recent event produced errors in predictive looking when things change. These errors were associated with better encoding of changed endings. And a subsequent neuroimaging study suggested, uh, produced results suggesting that these prediction errors result from memory retrieval during day two viewing. So the proposed chain of events that we're hypothesizing is that when you encounter a situation that resembles one you recently encountered, that spontaneously cues memory retrieval, which drives predictions. When these predictions lead to errors, this causes working memory updating and also long-term memory updating. Let me stop with the empirical research at this point and just try and pull all of this together. I've tried to argue that language and cognition depend on structured event representations, that building these representations is a series of acts of conceptualization, that gating based on prediction error is a potential updating mechanism that could trigger building a new event conceptualization. The evidence for that was that event segmentation is associated with changes in this situation, and that segmentation is associated also with prediction error. Event model updating leaves deep footprints on both immediate and long-term memory. We see this in the immediate updating effects and also in their associations with long-term memory. And I wanna argue that event model prediction and updating are systems that have evolved and are shared uh, between humans and many other species in order to allow us to reuse situations and to cope with changes in the situations that confront us whether we're understanding language or observing activity or acting on that activity. Now, I just mentioned language again, and I should admit that I have strayed into non-linguistic cognition for an embarrassing fraction of the second part of this talk. And I appreciate your indulgence in sticking with me as I did so. Let me just close with one possibly controversial point about event language. And to do that, I wanna use an example from narrative fiction. So this is a brief passage, four sentences from Tolkien's Hobbit. You could quibble a bit about the best way to count the number of event descriptions in this passage, but I would suggest that it comes to about 16 or so. They make up most of the discourse in this passage. And in this regard, this is utterly typical. It's not at all exceptional for narrative text to con consist mostly of event descriptions. And I would suggest that the reason that there is whole bodies of language use that have this structure is because a lot of what of our a lot of what our brains are doing when we're comprehending language, when we're producing language, or simply acting in the world, is constructing a series of representations of the events that might unfold around us. So I'll stop there. And let me just um, end by thanking uh, my lab group um, and our collaborators in the US and around the world. This work is all highly collaborative. And one of the great pleasures of getting to do some of this science is to interact with these great fellow scientists. So I'll stop there and I think we can open it up for discussion. Cool. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for this great presentation. Now we will start the discussion session with invited discussants, Alistair Knott, Associate Professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Otago, Anna Papafrugo, Professor in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Pennsylvania,
and Gerard, Gerard Altman, professor in the Department of Psychology psychological science at the University of Connecticut. I'd like to thank the three colleagues for accepting our invitation and for joining us today. There's so much to talk about, uh, but I want to jump straight into that Lord of the Rings, uh, the Hobbit extract that you had at the very end there. Um, so the first sentence was Gandalf sat, or the first clause was Gandalf sat, but that feels a little bit like a state to me, you know, if you're thinking about aspectual types or something. And so narrative events, nar sorry, you know, narratives in, written down in books and things are mixtures of states and an event. And I wonder, could you comment how the states uh, fit in to your account here? So I answer this question with some trepidation with Anna on the call because this is her wheelhouse. Um, and so look, one, one account, and, and I hope you'll jump in and correct me where I go astray and expand, but you know, one important thing is that there are some kinds of event concepts that inherently have the bounds baked into them. And there are others that don't. And this is reflected in the tense and aspect systems in lots of languages. Um, and it seems to be something, as Anne and her colleagues and others have shown, that people are sensitive to even when they are not um, having to formulate utterances. I think there is also evidence for thinking for speaking kinds of effects on this, such that the language that you habitually speak may affect how you habitually treat um, bounded versus unbounded events. Anna, you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I, we don't have evidence for the last claim, but we're actually testing for it in, in uh, current work. So um, I had a, a similar question. So I think, you know, the, you know, this answer, you know, I agree with everything you said. Um, my question, which I think is maybe what Ali was also uh, pointing at is, um, what is an event in, in the system that you're describing, right? And how can we distinguish it from non-events? And I'm asking again from the point of somebody who cares about language, because um, to talk about events in language, you, do, you care about the unit of representation, you care about the bits that, you know, comprise the unit and the rules that allow us to combine the little bits that make up events. So um, I'm trying to put together these very compelling demonstrations of how, about how we process these events online with the very detailed and very structured representations that we need for language. And uh, it would be helpful for us, I think, and for the audience, if you could talk a little bit about that mapping. Yeah. So event is one of these problematic everyday language terms that's been imported into cognitive science and neuroscience. Um, and it's definitely the case that, you know, sometimes we get in these conversations where two people are using the same word to mean different things. Um, Barbara Tversky and I, uh, in a 2001 paper, proposed a definition that uh, says that an event is a segment of time at a given location that's conceived by an observer to have a beginning and an end. And so it's a pretty neutral um, definition that would encompass both, you know, things like um, Jeff ate popcorn and uh, uh, Jeff pop popcorn. Um, but um, I I think it's not a not a bad one to work with. Um, I'll I'll jump in if I may just on that one uh, point because. That definition, um, and, and by the way, Jeff, it was just a beautiful talk. Um, I've got a, a couple of questions about the talk, but I just wanted to, to follow uh, Anna's point and then your response. Paradoxically, that leads to the case where um, you could have, um, as happens in my house, typically, there's a lot of noise, and then suddenly there's a frightening silence. Uh, and then there's noise again. And so the question is, is the silence the event because it's bounded by, um, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we project some sort of temporal boundary onto this silence. And, and, and I think there's compelling uh, uh, reasons to suppose, yeah, sure, why not? Or, or is it actually the, the, the change that occurred? So, so, you know, if we think causally what happened to that silence, something happened that actually was the end of another uh, of something and now we have the start of something 
and uh, at, at the end of this uh, silence event. And so I just I just wondered whether you know are you sort of you know at ease with with the sort of dilemma that poses, which is I think in the context of segmentation, if you're segmenting, you're sort of agnostic. Am I ending something? Am I starting something? But in the case of this silence, there's clearly an end. There's clearly a start. What's that in between? Mm -hmm. So I think you actually raised like three really important questions. One is, are the what's the figure and what's the ground? So um, like people will use the term event to mean a notable occurrence in the middle of something, which is exactly what we would call a boundary, right? And it's and, the, and that is not a distortion of natural language usage. It's totally fine to say, you know, that was a shocking sudden event to mean what in our model would be a boundary between events. Um, and then the second thing is, um, uh, that, that illustrates is that on my view, events are in people's heads. So that silence, if, if what, what, what makes it an event is that you conceived it to have a beginning and an ending. And in terms of the computational models, it, what hap what we're proposing is that you had a prediction error, um, when things went silent, and then you had another prediction error when, uh, something else started at the end of the silence. And in both of those cases, you updated your event representation. It's in virtue of that, that it's a, an event. That is to say, it's in virtue of psychological mechanisms that the thing is or is not an event. Um, and that leads to the third thing, which is uh, uh, that, that events are, are in the head, not in the world, or at least in both. So maybe I can, um, I'm, I'm... I'm going to jump in here because I just find this work very, very exciting, but it also leads to some interesting um, uh, questions. Uh, and, and I just have really a couple that I wanted to, to ask. I'll just ask one and then I'll pass over to the others. Um, but you talk a lot about uh, prediction error and updating of the, the mental model, the event model. How big an error? So in some sense, the way you talk about it, it sounds like um, a prediction error is a sort of categorical thing, and this updating process is a discrete process um, that occurs at particular points. When reading text, it sounds a little bit like, uh, you know, the old clausal processing uh, uh, approaches, because actually that's where you tend to have higher prediction error. Um, but, but is that realistic that... Um, we have a mechanism that creates this discontinuity in the updating, because in some sense, that makes it very difficult to, um, if the event model is um, driving uh, a, a segment a prediction, how are we gonna predict those finer details within an event uh, when when we're waiting for some larger prediction error. So how does that part work? That's such a great question. So um, so it, it's definitely intuitive and has been argued uh, vigorously by Marcus Hoff and others that event updating ought to be more a matter of degree than uh, of all or none. The mechanism that I'm proposing is ham-handed in that all it can do is let go of the old model and build a new one. I want to note a couple things that are important and then I want to say a couple words about the particular mechanisms that uh, the models that I've been associated with have proposed. Um, so one feature of our view that is, well it's both a feature and a bug, it's an aspect that is both a feature and a bug, is that we're proposing that people are maintaining and updating event models on multiple timescales. So if you observe what looks like a bigger event boundary by some measure or a smaller event boundary, one possibility is that's reflecting the nesting structure where the one that looks bigger is just because it was, you're updating both your fine grained event models and then some coarser grained ones and some coarser grained ones. Whereas the ones that look like 
itty bitty event boundaries, it's because you only updated the time boundaries. I think that's true, but I think it's a bug in the sense that it gives us more theoretical degrees of freedom to um, making it harder to distinguish between the continuous and the discrete updating accounts. Um, um, so let me just make, be a little bit more concrete by talking about like particular proposed mechanisms. So you asked, well, how does, you know, how, how big is big enough? Um, in an initial model developed by, with Jer Jeremy Reynolds and Todd Braver, we propose that you keep a running average of prediction error over time and you normalize the instantaneous prediction error relative to that. So like if you're just totally at sea in a new situation, you have chronically high prediction error, you don't wanna be constantly updating your event model. So the idea is the system will use gain control to get into a reasonable range. Um, a, a current model that I'm really excited about that was developed by Nick Franklin and Sam Gershman and several of us um, called the structured event memory model proposes a little more sophisticated mechanism. So it hypothesizes a, late, a set of latent states that could be throwing off the observations that you're seeing. And, at, and you're evaluating Bayesian predictability and prediction error in the sense of you're looking at the posterior likelihood of what you just saw relative to the likelihood of all the other possibilities, including the possibility that nothing in your history predicts and you've got to form a new event representation. Um, and so there the normalization is being done relative to the other things that could potentially account for what happened. I think you need some kind of normalization clearly. Um, and I think there are, there are you know, multiple candidates for what's the right normalization mechanism. That, that uh, track about hierarchical event representations could run and run, but I want to ask a question that's more to do with the, the linguistic manifestation of events, because there's something that came up on the, on the, on the chat from the web stream uh, from Artur Tur, uh, Terto, which is quite interesting. It's, the question is, what do you think about the role of prosody in signaling events in oral narratives? So, I mean, what's so interesting about, about your, your work is that it straddles linguistic uh, conceptions of events and non-linguistic ones. And I suppose the question is, what's the linguistic kind of unit associated with events that you want to relate to these event representations? Is it pr prosodic? Is it the clause? Is it something else? Maybe you could elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, so I like Rolf's proposal, Rolf Swan's proposal about like the lowest level that the system goes down to that, you know, it's an intonation unit, which is a convergence of, as I understand it, you know, uh, prosodic structure and syntactic structure, right? Um, now, how you build up from that, um, I think there's additional, uh, um, there's you know additional mechanisms that you need to account for that, and I think that that's like the same unit that you're talking about in your model. Um, you know the these little chunks of you've got an agent, a patient, a thing, um, and then something happens to it. Um, uh, none of the models, to my knowledge, of segmentation of narrative into events take prosody or the affective dimension of the semantics of the um, utterances into account. Those things are related to each other and they're related to the rest of the semantics. Um, and I think that's a huge open area. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, there's all these, I mean, all the, all the amazing work on, on the, the fine timing and the, prosodic cues that, be, that speakers provide and that um, and the continuous feedback that happens as we ground elements of a discourse in a conversation. I think that all of those are in, really important for understanding how people are building event representations and have been like totally understudied, right? Our, everything I know about is kind of very nuts and bolts, um, concrete object semantics for the most part. And I want to say, especially our work. Um, and I think there's a, there's a huge open area there. 
So building up on this theme, I have a further question about sort of language and vision, because we know, and you know, the, everybody in the audience will know that languages are different, right? And they track different features of these events and some languages track, you know, telicity in English, we can say peel a banana versus peel bananas and they're different things. Other languages track evidentiality, whether the speaker find out about something directly or indirectly. So I was interested in your observation that, you know, these models of event cognition carve nature at, at its joints. How do we know where the joints are if perfectly fine, reasonable, I assume, right? Human beings carve it up differently depending on the language they speak linguistically, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a tough question. Okay, so... Um... I think that, you know, the slogan thinking for speaking story kind of works here and I'm going to appeal to it as I understand it. And please correct me if I'm butchering the account. But, you know, I think you start with a set of representation, representational mechanisms that are um, not unique to a speaker of a language, not unique to speakers of any language, in fact, are shared um, across multiple taxa. And, um, and then you also have um, the language system, which is constantly interacting with those representations. And depending on the needs of a community's um, particular situation and the accidents of history of languages, you develop differences in how languages solve the problem of coordination. And those tweak a little bit this other part. And I think that what that does is change the joints of the nature for the speakers in that community. So if I speak a language that habitually um, attends to um, uh, cardinal direction, maybe because I live in a place where that's a readily available cue and it's important for the way my culture works, then that's all of a piece. It's not, it's not as simple as um, language determining thought. It's all of a, uh, a set of cultural, integrated cultural practices. And those effects, um, are, you know, that I, I know that there are large debates about the existence of some of these effects, but I don't think there's any um, position that, I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think mm -hmm. anybody currently holds a position that these like totally reshape the thoughts that the brain can, or the way that brains conceptualize the world. Maybe, maybe yeah, depending, on. depending on, you know, depending on who you ask, right? So I would personally, um, I personally like the account you began with, where there's a common, you know, a shared, you know, core, uh, you know, um, part of cognition that we all share, uh, but not everybody would believe that. And there are, as you say, debates about that. The language on, the language on um, is speak, speaking for thinking um, or thinking for speaking position is neutral with respect to this question. This is a position that is widely shared. And it says that people, when it comes to speaking, prepare a propositional representation that is commensurate with what their language requires. This has to be true because people have to mobilize different resources, both conceptual and phonological in order to speak. I think this leaves open the question of whether the language you speak has an effect on the other, the non-linguistic representations that are available to you or uh, you know, preferred when you have a choice in situations where you don't have to speak or understand language. Yeah. Let, let me just clarify. I'm not, I, I don't want to say that the non-linguistic part is itself cognitively universal in the sense that it's mm. exactly the same for everybody in, in like there's non-linguistic cultural variation in people's concepts, right? So like in, depending on the culture I, I live in, I'm gonna see different objects, different animals, different plants, different actions. I'm gonna interact with them differently. I'm gonna have a different conceptual system and, and within a culture, different individuals are going to have slightly different conceptual systems. And every, every way we look at it, um, that appears to be true. And I think that the language effects, what I'm trying to say is that's all of a piece with that. The things that determine variability across people and across cultures in conceptualization um, are both, are, are all tied up with the language system, but it's not a simple one-way causal arrow is not a great account. Mm -hmm. 
I'm so tempted, Jeff, to ask you what exactly you mean by conceptualization, but maybe I can um, uh, ask you a slightly different question, although maybe I'm hoping that you'll somehow bring these together. Um, you seem to distinguish between, uh, in, in, in one of the diagrams that you put up, you distinguish between um, episodic memory, it was in one box, mm -hmm. and uh, event model was in another box. And um, so I wanted to ask, on what basis are you, if, if you are, distinguishing between those? Is it in respect, perhaps, of what the content is, the, the nature of the conceptualization there? Um, what is the basis for a distinction? Good. Thank you for asking me that and not giving in to temptation. Uh, um, so, yeah, so the, the, dis, the distinction there is, is pretty concrete. So what, what Gabriel Advanski and I call the current working event model is hypothesized to be a representation of the event that you are currently engaged in or observing or comprehending. And that may exist at multiple timescales in your brain at once, but it's thought to be actively maintained by recurrent neural firing and maybe by rapid synaptic mechanisms. Um, but once it's gone, it's gone. Whereas episodic memory is all your other representations of events that you've experienced in your past which may include a representation of the thing that you're involved in now. So the best evidence is that though many of us have carried around an implicit intuition that what happens is you have a working memory representation then you somehow copy it and put it on a shelf in episodic memory, that instead what's going on is you've got one set of fast um, resource depending mechanisms that implement the current working model. And at the same time, you've got mechanisms building up um, what we think of as episodic memory. Your brain's using both of those right now online. In five seconds, if a new event has begun, that first set of mechanisms isn't going to be accessible, but the second one still will. But it's not that you don't use those even right online. So that's the distinction between stuff that is actively maintained requires metabolic activity to keep stuff around for more than a, uh, a small fraction of a second versus things that are stored in virtue of permanent synaptic changes. Um, and then within that long-term store, um, you can fruitfully distinguish between episodic representations that capture the unique um, associations amongst features of an event and uh, what are usually called semantic representations in the memory world, but in the memory world, what's, what that means is that these are representations that capture statistical regularities over lots of experiences rather than the unique conjunctions of a particular episode. Well, so just to um, follow up on, on that last point and, and bring it back to something else that you, you mentioned early on, you talked about event models enabling predictive processing, but clearly it's an interplay between the current event model your semantic memory, your episodic memory, and, and, and so on. So it's all of those systems together are presumably driving the predictive process, maybe at different levels. Yes, absolutely. So the most controversial thing I think about our view is concerns the dynamics of when all the other stuff, episodic memory, semantic memory, get to influence the stream that drives predictions because the model says that at least for a subset of the system, um, that influence is not flat over time, but it's basically spiky at the updates. And so basically your episodic memory doesn't get to say much about what might happen as long as you're in the middle of an event, it only gets consulted at the event boundaries. And, um, you know, I, I would be lying if I said that like the evidence has come down quickly and incontroverted incontrovertible, incontrovertibly in favor of that claim. Um, I think there's still a lot more to be done to investigate that. And I think it's a really, I think it's one of the most interesting proposals. Again, 
one of the kind of bug feature things about this account is none of this is saying that there aren't other mechanisms in the brain that drive predictions, right? So we know that there are lots of like very fast local modality specific predictive mechanisms throughout the brain. Andy Clark has a wonderful review paper that focuses on those. And, um, and so if you saw like an influence from say the knowledge system that's popping up in the middle of an event, I could weasel out of that being a failure of the event updating view by saying, well, that's some other mechanism that's doing it. And so we need, we need good methods for roping off what's really these event models um, that's driving things from other, these other mechanisms. So do you believe that event models, when you say that they enable um, predictive processing, um, as you know, I've said that there are consequences of it and that one of the advantages of taking that view is when you look at certain kinds, certain classes of computational model that um, have these emergent representations, what you end up with is, is actually an account of the representational content that's sort of part and parcel of that emergence and, and the notion that, that um, the, the, the event model is a consequence of predictive uh, processing. Uh, I mean, I think that they're potentially two sides of the same coin, um, but I just wanted to hear a little bit more from you about uh, why you fake, I mean, well, you have a lot of empirical evidence to, to land on one side of the coin or the other to mix metaphors, um, but I, I was curious what, what you thought about that. No, I, I would totally agree that that one's event representations are both a consequence and a cause of prediction. I think that um, the, the sense in which um, improving predictions follows from event models is not a mechanistic sense, but the functional sense. So I think the reason there's an adaptive pressure to build these um, metabolically intensive representational systems is that they improve our ability to navigate the world and anticipate what's coming down the pike. Um, but mechanistically, it's a cycle. There's, this, there's a constant interplay between the representations driving new predictions and then the predictions le leading to updating of representations and some of the content that gets in when you update is predicted rather than sensed content. Um, just staying with neuroscience for a moment, um, you're thinking of event boundaries very much as being defined by prediction errors. But I'm thinking sometimes if events are uh, actions of people, then they also kind of achieve tasks. And maybe at the end of those tasks, you expect there to be reward, you expect there to be dopamine. So how does reward feature in event boundaries? Does that have a role to play as well as prediction error? And do these line up? So I'd like you to ask, ask about that. I think this is another great area for research. So a lot of um, our thinking about the role of prediction errors in guiding learning and memory updating comes from work on reinforcement learning. And in that, in those paradigms, the rewards, the, sorry, the, predi the, the predictions and the prediction errors are all about reward. So yes. in the classic um, studies from Wolfram Schultz and his colleagues, a monkey um, gets a juice reward and comes to, from time to time and comes to learn that that juice reward is signaled by a light turning on beforehand. And so initially there's a prediction error when the juice is delivered, it's a positive reward prediction error. Um, but after learning, the, the juice becomes predictable from the light turning on. So there's no prediction error when the juice is delivered. Instead, what's unpredictable is the, when the light's gonna turn on. And so there's a prediction error at those point. And you see in these, um, uh, in these cells in the midbrain dopamine area that, uh, that or it's the same region that we focused on in the yeah. prediction error study I mentioned briefly. You see these phasic responses initially to the juice and after learning to the light. Okay. So one of the debates in that literature, which I think has not been resolved, has been raised really productively by Emma Dussel and others is, um, uh, is 
this intrinsically a reward prediction or is it, are we seeing it through the lens of reward because our paradigms are mostly reward-based paradigms? And so there might be different signaling pathways for reward prediction errors and um, informational prediction errors. There might be, um, it might be that that, that, that midbrain dopamine pathway actually does signal non-reward related prediction errors. Um, there are different subpopulations of cells and we know that there are cells in that system that signal novelty as distinct from prediction error. So I don't know yet what the answer is, but I would like it to be um, just for parsimony that you can find a common category that encompasses both reward and non-reward -re -re related prediction errors. Yeah, I think on the parsimony front, it's also interesting to think Think that volitional action events is just one sort of event, and there are also events that involve just things changing, the sort that Jerry was talking about. Um, and the reward story doesn't play so well for them. I suppose it could still be a prediction error uh, and a reward associated with that. But the prediction error seems more general, and so it's quite interesting to imagine trying to uh, sort of assimilate the the rewards account to the prediction account. But yeah, it's. I have another question that has to do with the counting events. I know mm -hmm. you mentioned that when you were looking at language and it may seem straightforward if you're counting events in language, even though there you can also, there's also questions, but how do you individuate events in you know, some of your clips? I was wondering, especially um, about cases where an event is interrupted, sort of the inverse of the silence case that Jerry mentioned. Yep. Uh, can you link the two bits and think of them as the same event, given that you have these interruptions in the middle, these breaks? Yeah, this is a super interesting question. I have multiple groups of colleagues that are um, worrying about this. Um, Michael Kabobi wrote this really provocative um, theoretical chapter about what he calls strands. The idea being that there might be things like um, preparing to give a really important talk that you're terrified to death about giving, which doesn't happen as one continuous thing. It's interrupted by a bunch of stuff, but it still has an in integral of coherence. Um, and so uh, we've actually been um, thinking about this a bunch and, and um, Simon Dennis has uh, also um, raised uh, really interesting questions about how one might model these things. And I think it's, you know, there are, we can go after this empirically. It's not just an, but it's, but it's a challenging problem. So I think the kinds of questions you want to ask are when people experience interdigitated events like that, can you show that there are representations that are either latently active, like the kinds of working memory representations that Brad Postel and his colleagues have been studying and they get, get juggled in and out as needed. Um, and can you show that that, that, that drives the, the dynamic, dynamics of the behavior? Mm. Yeah, the interruption thing is extremely interesting, both on the neuroscience and on the linguistic side, because mm -hmm. often these atelic things or maybe progressive things in English, you know, I was walking through the park. Those are things which appear the way they do, like in a narrative, it was because of an interruption that occurred. And so it's super interesting to think if you can correlate those kind of linguistic uh, constructions that express an activity, especially that got interrupted, if there's any correlation between that and what we know about the interruption mechanisms that operate in neuroscience, like the stuff that Corbetta and Shulman have done. So that's, a, that's another place where you have this incredibly interesting kind of triangulation you can do between straight sort of linguistics and, and then more kind of neuroscience. It's a really interesting one. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask actually a, a related to all of this and, and the, um, I'm not sure I can say the word, the interdigitation of, of events. Uh, and ask a question of Anna, um, who um, loves language. Uh, I, I loved language, but I found that I sort of left it a little bit more behind as I've got more and more into event uh, representations. But, um, you know, we can assume that evolutionarily 
event cognition uh, predates, to put it very crudely, uh, the emergence of the linguistic systems that may be used to refer to those events. But it's curious, or maybe it's not curious, that whereas we can get um, I think what we can, what the interdigitation tells us is that you can get cross dependencies in event representation. We tend not to see cross dependencies so much in, in, in language. Uh, you know, some people have claimed that there are uh, cross dependencies in, in, in Dutch, for example, and, and, and certain other cases. Um, and what I do you mean? That, there's, there's long distance dependencies. Yeah, long distance right. cross dependencies where the dependency you have a dependency from here to here and then from here to here. Across um, Syria. Rather than nested dependencies. Yeah. And, um, and I just wonder, you know, first of all, do we think that in event representations, we do have those uh, nested, uh, sorry, cross dependencies? And if we do, then why, why didn't language evolve to, to mirror those? I mean, to me, there's, I'm sure there's a, you know, a deeper discussion here that we could have about different kinds of structures and representations. But to me, just tracking that an event is the same despite interruptions is the same question as asking how we can track a sentence amidst interruptions, right? What if you lose the signal? How can you tell that this is the same sentence you were listening to, right, in some sense? Why does that happen? Because you track structure. And you can perhaps fill in bits of the structure or you see causal relationships between the bit that you witnessed and the mysterious missing bit. So in some sense, there is a, a lot of you know, continuity in terms of the representational questions between the event cognition and the language cognition. And the reason you do that, and the reason why this is hard, I think Jeff would agree, is that um, it's hard to quite strike this balance between what's in the input and what you track and what representations you build and how you can pick up and keep going um, after the interruption, right? And how you link these two in some cases, but not in others, right? And what counts as, a, as an interrupted event versus two different events, right? But I think this, this really gets to the question of individuation, of you know, what kinds of representational commitments you make when you build an event, just like when you build a sentence, right? So a sentence is not just, you know, um, as you said, like putting pauses or putting breaks in between bits of the speech stream, it's actually building a structure, right? And it's a challenging task. It's a complicated task, even though it seems to us easy. Same thing with events. I don't think for a layperson it's mysterious how you, we track events across interruptions. Um, and yet, for cognitive science, it's you know, it's a it's a deep question. But I guess, like in language, we're tracking events. I mean. I, I mean we have to be careful about what we mean by tracking, but we're right. predicting what's going to, let's pretend we're predicting what's going to come next at, at different um, uh, temporal resolutions. So sure. we can talk about um, some uh, event like, uh, I don't know, uh, something happening over a week, but then something uh, that happens at the end of the week and into the beginning of the next. And mm -hmm. these are two separate, events but nonetheless they overlapped in time and we're we're tracking those across time um uh i i don't know to what extent one can say that one sees a similar i mean obviously there's hierarchical representations and there are different uh, also different temporal resolutions at which we uh we see different uh linguistic categories you know different uh levels of linguistic representation um I mean, it's the same. I mean, to me, again, there's lots of similarities. If you look at it in the right way, you can look within the sentence and you can see hierarchies all the way down, right? And you can also look upward and see hierarchies all the way up if you really want to go into narrative like Jeff does and look at, you know, paragraph structure and connectives and what you track beyond the single sentence. Um, so in some sense, the questions are at, at, in a very broad sense, very similar. But the, the difference, I think, which is why what makes the linguist job perhaps a little easier is that we know more about language and we have a publicly observable uh, reality to track and analyze. Whereas for event cognition, we really need to do all of these clever experiments that Jeff has been doing. And we really need to probe something which is elusive and not public. Um, so apropos of that, let me just plug one, um, one development that's coming out of our lab uh, very soon um, to an archive near you. So I totally agree that like 
well-characterized descriptions of what is the situation that someone is doing event cognition on are totally crucial for building and benchmarking these models. So one thing that we've done um, with the support of the Office of Naval Research's multidisciplinary, uh, sorry, multi-university research initiative program is, and this is in collaboration with a bunch of other labs, to build um, this uh, 25 hour corpus of highly tracked, highly annotated recordings of everyday human activities that capture the position of the body with millisecond accuracy that label all the uh, objects that the person might interact with and that include multiple camera angles. And so Matt Bezdek is the lead scientist on that. And we're currently um, preparing that for, we deposited most of it in the open science framework and getting ready to release it to the world and, and submit a paper describing what's in there. So coming soon to an archive near you. And I, I really hope that this is going to be super helpful for, um, for all kinds of cognitive scientists and computer scientists and linguists as a, as a resource for event cognition. Yeah, and that brings kind of practical AI techniques, AI video processing techniques or machine vision techniques into the picture as well, which is another fantastic new sort of method that's coming online in this area. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've, been, we've been relying very heavily on these um, large scale statistical semantic models such as word to vec and glove and GPT-2 um, uh, in, in trying to scale this stuff up to giving adequate descriptions of real behavior. I wanted, I wanted to come back to some kind of linguistics, some heavy linguistics stuff, because you mentioned some stuff at the very beginning of your talk about serial verb constructions, which I found extremely interesting. And so I suppose the general question is, if you, have a, if you have a serial verb construction or certain things where there's more than one verb, it's still just one event. So if you're gathering and collecting, you do those two things at the same time. So somehow while you're processing that, you have an activation of the, of the action of gathering, but also of the action of collecting because the gathering maybe is the means to the end of collecting or something like that. So can I ask you to speculate about what's going on in the sort of motor system, for instance, of the person who's doing that, do you think that the, the, the sort of the mechanism for processing or performing atomic events like that includes um, it includes mechanisms for activating two uh, action categories, for instance, that have different roles? Um, you know, for instance, the cause thing and the causing thing, or something like that. Do you, do you see serial verbs as, as pointing at those sorts of mechanisms? We're looking for cross like, relationships between linguistics and the neuroscience. Is that on the, on the agenda for those? So I'm going to be somewhat circumspect about the linguistic mechanisms, lest I get too far out over my skis. Um, but the reason I told, I totally agree that, that you know, the, the serial verbs in particular, in particular as a mechanism for constructing event representations just strike me as really, really interesting. Um, and what it suggests to me is that there's this constant um, constraint-based coordination between mechanisms that are doing things like running simulations in your head or running motor planning if you're executing the thing yourself um, and systems for selecting a sequence of words um, if you're producing language or, or assembling a sequence of words as you're receiving it. Um, and that these things are continuously influencing each other so that when one of those um, serial verb constructions pops out, it's because there's a mutual constraint between like, okay, what's the best concept? What's the, what's the best representation to span what's going on in terms of the actual acting and perceiving and how it's being talked about by me or uh, the speaker. Um, and that these things and in different languages, depending on what they habitually have to address can, and, and on their histories converge on different solutions. So you could lexicalize something instead of having it be, and 
be a serial verb. And I don't know, like, synchronically, if it turns out that lots of these serial verb constructions, if they get used a lot, wind up getting lexicalized or not. Um, but there's all these kinds of things that could, and, and that, sorry, this is getting really fuzzy, but basically, you know, you've got a bunch of constraints and it's settling in on the constraint that works. And, and isn't that exactly what goes on in your model that, right, that the system that's representing what's actually happening out in the world is continuously constraining in real time. Um, and the language system is, I mean, I keep calling them systems as if, which pulls them apart, but there's these factors that are more close to the language and these factors that are more close to the action control that are constraining each other in real time and reusing some of the same representational media. Yeah. I, mean, I, I like, you know, it would be nice if the details of the syntactic structure, for instance, in a causative for construction or something that undergoes the causative alternation, and that's not the same as serial verbs, but it would be nice if those things diagnosed um, uh, aspects of, for instance, the, the action execution uh, sort of circuits in, yes. in neuroscience. It would be nice if you could use the presence of those constructions and you know, how they've been analyzed syntactically. Uh, yeah as a kind of information, as like an empirical window onto things that you could test in, you know, about the way actions are composed or motor actions are combined and stuff like that. So I think it's an interesting idea, but I think it, the issue of cross-linguistic variation kind of is a fly in the ointment there. It makes it, you know, you have to look for universals really at some level and they you might know, pop up in different ways, maybe sometimes there. Yeah. So, but I think that again, I mean, it seems like the, the, the the sort of the, the thrust of the whole talk is there's really useful work to be done uh, at the interface between sort of formal models of linguistics and, and models of event cognition, you know, made by neuroscientists and tested by neuroscientists. And I think it's just another example that I hadn't thought of until you did the talk. So, yeah. You're here. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Zacks, Professor Nott, Professor Papa Frugo, and Professor Altman for your collaboration with the series of Berlin Al Vivo. That was an excellent discussion. I'd like to take this opportunity to invite everyone to continue watching our live lectures. And Professor Zacks, would you like to say something before we close the transmission? I would just like to again thank you. Um, and thank Abra Luna Vivo and thank Ali and Jerry and Anna for uh, joining us tonight. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you once again. Thanks everyone. And until